Super. So let's let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. And after a, a small play around with the Zoom system, here we are. Um, just a, a warm welcome from myself and the team. Just to introduce us uh, very quickly, um, I'm Caleb Jackson, Head of Change for Youth and Criminal Justice here at Youth Endowment Fund. And we're joined by my colleagues, Sarah and Hannah, who would or will introduce themselves as as we go on. You're here because you've heard about our latest theme grant round, Trusted Adults, which was launched last Friday. And really the purpose of this conversation or this webinar is to give you what you need in order to apply and, and make sure that you're the right fit in that respect. So everything we'll walk through will give you a, a great synopsis as to what, what it is we're looking for and who we're looking to work with and partner with on this uh, particular themed round. Just about to share my screen and we are being recorded so that it becomes available to anybody who can't make this date and time because we know that many of you who do many different types of things aren't always available so those of you who've made it today thank you great to be able to have you play in but equally those who are watching the video back hope you get as much information as needed and you can always reach out to us with the details that we'll share much later on so on to sharing my screen and to kick us off. This is the Youth Endowment Funds application workshop. And as I said, the whole purpose of this is to give you what you need in order so that you have the best chance if you feel eligible to apply to this particular round. So why we're here today, let's really outline them a bit more. Well, we, we, we know we need to work with different stakeholders across different sectors and uh, many of you would be leaning into a trusted adult approach which is why you're here. Uh, we want to outline what we're looking for and what we're looking to fund just being really crystal clear because the thing we're most aware of is that there are so many of you doing uh, great things and you know resources are pressured and so what we wouldn't want you to do is allocate your resources to something that doesn't quite fit what we're looking for or what you're doing. The other one is to explain our approach to evaluation it's so important that we build together strong, robust evaluation because the whole purpose of what we do is we find good work, we find what works in order to work for change. And so a lot of that is stipulated on the strength of the evidence that we find. If you want to know more about what this theme round, where it came from and how it's coming to manifestation, we do have a link that's on the theme round page on our website which we'll share with you. Uh, if you click that link at the bottom, there's a video that's about 15 to 20 minutes long. That gives you a summary of where, how we've come to our thinking. We wanna say a huge thank you to so many of our, our colleagues, uh, wider colleagues, external colleagues, who have helped us to frame what this round looks like by telling us their real uh, opinions and uh, experts and sharing their expertise and insights so that we can make sure that we make the best with it. It is their insight that allowed us to be grounded in, in what we might look at. So thank you to them if they're on this video webinar. And then the third part is to talk you through the application process, as in what we're really looking for within an application, just to give you the top tips according to our, our, our process. And this is our fourth inaugural uh, theme grant round, which is which is fab. We've come a long way. We've learned so much, and so much of your feedback has helped us to iterate and become clearer uh, uh, and uh, and better with how we engage with those prospective applicants in each round. And lastly, and most importantly, if we missed anything out, we'll answer your questions. So please do put that in the chat, and we'll do our best to get round to as many as possible. We do have an FAQ section which is quite generic for most rounds and does pick up the majority of questions that get asked. So do check out the FAQ, spend some time there. If, if what you're asking is beyond the nuance of an FAQ, do get in touch and we'll, we look forward to uh, uh, speaking uh, with you and answering whatever you need from, from us to make your application as strong as possible. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who will introduce herself and talk to you a bit more about what we're going to fund. Thank, thanks, Caleb. Um, 
Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, just to highlight, I think chat has been disabled, so Q&A is the function to use if you, if you want to ask us any questions, please feel free to ask us throughout. What I might do, Caleb and Hannah, is to ask you um, as we go through this, if there are any questions that pop up and you feel you need to stop me because I can answer them in flight, please do so. Um, but we will make sure that we attend to your questions throughout as part and parcel of this session. So uh, what will we fund through this grant round? What does eligibility look like and what are we most interested in and what will we invest in? Thanks, Caleb. Fantastic. So I, I think it's probably worth saying, and Caleb has alluded to this, that actually a trusted adult is fundamental to everything that we deliver and, and therefore is really cross-cutting and really broad. So we uh, have worked really hard to identify what does a trusted adult mean in the context of a theme grant round? What are the things that we most interested in um, and who are the young people we'd really like to reach as part of this? That's also based on the fact that we already have some funded portfolios of uh, projects and evaluations that we're working with. Um, and we want to be really clear that we're able to add value in terms of our learning and evaluation in terms of building the evidence base and also working with groups of young people that we may not already be working with to the level that we wish to do so. So for this particular round, um, the, the three key areas that we're most interested in is looking at mentoring programmes who are working within a tertiary level. Um, and key or caseworker models. We've also said that we're interested in integrated approaches. And what we mean by that is, uh, Caleb, if you go on to the next slide for me, please, um, is essentially um, looking at tertiary mentoring or key worker and caseworker with something else. So that could be, for example, mentoring plus therapy. That could be a caseworker model plus employability support. There could be many other things. These are literally just our examples. Um, and what you'll see that we're, we're most interested in in terms of tertiary level programmes, and, and we'll come on to this shortly around the type of young people we're interested in working with, um, are those young people that are already known to statutory organisations, already involved in or affiliated with groups, for example, often referred to as gangs. Um, and, and we're really clear that we want to work with uh, these young people through mentoring programmes and also key and caseworker models to really understand how a trusted relationship in the context of mentoring and key worker caseworker models could work to support a young person to have, have uh, more positive outcomes. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Sarah. So these are things that we want to talk about because what we realise is there are some other types of approaches within the trusted adult theme and we have to do further investigative work. And so what we've done is we've talked about two different separate areas that we might take a different approach on, but it's important for us to articulate and share that with you as a, as a cohort and make sure that we make in our sense of why we've made these decisions. So the first one is, and, and these go under the bracket of out, but what we're doing about it. So detaching outreach youth work is out of this round. We won't be funding anything in this round. So if you're delivering detaching outreach youth work as part of your trusted adults approach, we won't be doing anything in this distinct round. However, what we understand and know is that we we took detaching outreach youth work out because it, it, it's really tricky and challenging to evaluate. And so understanding that and playing due diligence and, and giving it the just uh, attention that it deserves, we've given ourselves longer time to further understand what might be possible. So does it mean it's completely out? No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is this is so precious that for us to rush it and add it to what we're doing right now will mean that we don't get the level of robust evidence for which it stands for if it was to be found to work. What we've got to do is ensure that we have everything we need to be able to really test this properly. So we're committed to better understanding the potential of detached and outreach youth work. And at the moment, we're going around speaking to a number of key deliver, delivery bodies, stakeholders, and influencers who know a lot about detached and outreach youth work to get a bit of a summary as to what we might do. The idea is that at the end of that conversation and uh, the research effectively, we'll come up with a statement which says, this is what we're gonna be committed to do. So we wanted to really share that so that people understand that we're not saying that detached and outreach youth work 
is never going to be looked at. We're saying that it needs sensitive time and and resources to make sure that we are able to try and do something if if that's possible. So that's the touch and outreach youth work. There is a second part that really fits within the trusted adult team, which is violence interruptions, which are programs that will go to places using sometimes and more likely young individuals who used to live um, or be involved with, with gangs. And they have the networks and the ability to be able to quickly get to where a problem might be escalating to de de-escalate it. And really it's intelligence led, but it's peer supported. And without those key people within peer support, the issues around violence will continue to escalate. So, you know, uh, when one group goes after another and, and another group returns back to that group and, and go on, so on and so forth. So in order to diffuse those situations, violent interrupters are, are a great way to do that. So we're interested in that model and we're interested to know who out there. You might be someone that fits our definition on the website. We have a clear definition as to what we mean by violence interrupters. If you think that it's what you do and it's really in line with our definition, please do get in touch with us. We've given the specific contact details to be able to do that because what we are committing to is that we could fund those programs as part of this round. But please do get in touch quickly. We are asking for a quick paragraph from you in order to summarize what you do and see if we can take on a conversation about that in that respect. So let's talk about eligibility to this round and, and it's back over to Sarah for that. Thanks, Caleb. Maybe before I go into eligibility and in part, the eligibility question does answer the two questions that we have in the Q&A section, which is what do we mean as ter in terms of tertiary mentoring? I would say maybe maybe the, the word tertiary is uh, slightly ambiguous and there are different definitions of that. What is more helpful is understanding the type of young people we wish to support through this, this front round. Who would we like to reach and what does that look like? And I think that will give you a better idea of what we mean by tertiary mentoring. Um, so in terms of the young people that we'd really like to work with, we're, they're primarily going to be aged between 10 and 18, um, and they're going to have one or more of the following characteristics. Um, don't worry if you forget these, because if you go onto our website and you go into the trusted adult section in our funded um, uh, funding area or funded programs area, what you'll be able to see is our application guidance. It's a really extensive document. I would use that as your aid memoir to understand really um, whether you want to apply for this grant round and the key things that we're looking for. But I will run through it uh, here now just to, to answer the question. Um, so uh, we, we would uh, primarily work with young people aged between 10 and 18 who have one of the more one or more of the following characteristics or unmet needs. So either affiliations with groups often referred to as gangs involved in crime, violence and trafficking, um, young people who are affected by serious violence, criminal or sexual exploitation as perpetrators or victims, part of families with history of uh, harmful or challenging behaviour and rep repetitive cycles of abuse, trauma and neglect, um, and are in contact with services that target youth offending and or affiliation with groups involved in violence or criminal and sexual exploitation, and have been in custody or known to the police and multi-agency safeguarding teams. So it's looking at those key characteristics and unmet needs. Um, the age range is pretty, pretty static, primarily working within that 10 to 18 years, and making sure that we're, your project really works with one um, of those key characteristics or unmet needs is essential in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, so it, to an extent, I'd kind of park what tertiary mentoring means, and I would look at, does your mentoring programme service uh, or, or aim to support young people who may have uh, one of these characteristics or unmet needs? Caleb, would that be fair to say? Yeah, that's that's really, really bang on. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and, and it helps us to, to clarify that position and part of the reason behind this is we've got so much that we're looking at and funding and resourcing through our other theme grant rounds which is at the risk at risk level you know pre before really understanding um, some of those kind of mandatory milestones which would just uh, uh, differentiate between a young person who is um, uh, escalating um, and, and a young person who isn't 
hasn't even been signified as even an issue in that in that sense it just helps us to make sure that we're targeting the right types of children and actually you know we some of our research says that these types of young people uh, often have the least amount of resources apportioned to them so we're keen to um, level the playing field by looking at what Sarah's described Thanks, Caleb. And, and just to build on that, there was a question around Prue's um, working with uh, young people who are in Prue's. Again, it's about whether the young people you're working with um, have at least one of these unmet needs or characteristics. So um, really the environment or um, where it's being delivered, um, not that that doesn't necessarily matter, but it's more about are you aligned to the, the young people we wish to support within this round? And it links to either mentoring, case worker, key worker models or an integrated approach. So they would be the things to really think through. Um, more broadly in terms of eligibility, um, the application form is essentially split into two parts. So the first bit, then there's about 16 small questions, so 16 pages, so 16 questions really, that help uh, you understand whether you're eligible for, for our funding. Um, the first thing really is to understand whether you operate in England and or Wales, because that's our area in which we work. Um, are you a registered organisation or a statute, uh, statutory body? That's really important to us and we need to understand that. Um, your project is directly working towards impacting at least one of our child and young person outcomes known to reduce youth violence. If you want to know what are the outcomes of interest are, again, if you look at the application guidance, it will list for you the primary outcomes of interest for this round, but also the secondary outcomes as well with the relevant definitions so you can understand where it fits with your project. Um, it's really important that the project's already being delivered. So what we don't necessarily want is something that's brand new. Um, it may be that there, there are occasions where something's been delivered, but there's been a break of, say, 10 months. As long as there's been a, as long as the break's reasonably short, i.e. it's not a programme that was delivered 15 years ago and it's never been delivered since, I do think we would consider it, but it would be, worth, be worthwhile reaching out to us to have a conversation about that, depending on what that programme looked like. But one of the reasons it's really important to us to ensure that the project's already delivering is to ensure that there's a level of consistency of delivering that would enable us to be able to evaluate it in the way in which we would need to. Um, as I've mentioned, primarily aged between 10 to 18, that, you know, there is a little bit of slippage there, but primarily we will be looking at 10 to 18 because that's our main area of focus as a What Work Centre. Um, and also as well, uh, we want to make sure that uh, every young person is assigned to either a mentor and or case or key worker because they're the, the, the primary focuses of, uh, or foci of our, um, of our funding round. Um, we'd want to be able to know that the, what you're describing or the projects that you offer is different to the statutory care that a young person would always receive. So is it different to, to what is already kind of set up within a, a local authority? Is it, is, is it different from what we would call business as usual, what they would uh, receive if your intervention wasn't in place? Um, we ideally would like you to have the potential to reach approximately um, 100 young people, given the size of evaluation we want to look at. However, we can work with you on this if you're a bit short of that, uh, that number and there would need to be some support with scaling up. But we need to think about what would reach look like at scale um, so we can work with enough young people to really understand whether uh, something works or not. Um, and we really need people to be committed to working with an independent evaluation partner, which is chosen uh, from our YEF panel. So we have an independent panel and we go through um, a commissioning process um, uh, at certain stages of the um, uh, uh, funding round itself. And we match evaluators with, um, with projects. Uh, and we really need projects to be able to be up with that. Everything that we do as an evaluator, uh, sorry, everything that we do as What Work Centre is based around delivery through the context of evaluation. We deliver to evaluate, to understand, to build the evidence, and primarily really find out what works for young people. Thanks, Caleb. Before moving on, there are a number of questions that I think that have come through. So let me just maybe pick up on some of those if that's okay before going through to the evaluation, because I think I could answer these re most of these reasonably quickly. Um, so um, would you consider an integrated model that is focused on ca casework that integrates aspects related to detached outreach work? 
but not centering on. So one of the things that we have actually said is, for example, Joanna, if um, young people are referred from detached youth work or outreach work into a programme, we would consider that. If there are other things that you're, you're, you're kind of considering, I guess we'd be interested to hear that. But the, the main focus or the centre would be that caseworker model. So understanding that consistency. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you're if you're saying that that would the caseworker model would be um, the centre of that, but there would be an integrated approach with detached and outreach would be interested to see what that is. So definitely would be open to that. Um, would you consider group mentoring or is it just one to one? Jenny, really good question. Um, it, it's about what's appropriate for your project and what's appropriate for the young people. That's why it's really broad. It could be group. It could be one to one. It could be a combination of the two, depending on what your programme is. So again, uh, we would be open to, to hearing more about you on that. Um, it says the project must currently must be currently delivered. Can we use evidence from a project that was being delivered but isn't currently? I think you can. I guess my, my question would be, how long ago was it delivered? Would it be quite quick and easy for you to get it up and running again? Do you have experience of delivering something similar? So they would be the things to think through. How... Um, how uh, ingrained was that project when it was being delivered um, and again really refer back to our application guidance because it will give you some clear guidance on that if you're unable to get a satisfactory answer you will see i think it's um uh, grants at youth endowment fund dot uk i think um uh, please drop a message there and we can pick that up and uh, we, we can carry on discussion about that if need be uh, fantastic. That's a better explanation of tertiary. Super. Yeah, sorry, um, just, just, just a quick note on, on, on your previous point. Um, just to offer an example, if your programme finished a month ago uh, and ran out of funding, uh, then, then yeah, please do yeah. apply. Um, if your programme ran out a year ago um, and you're going to have to start everything up, it's going to take you six months to a year to like get everything back to where it was, then it's probably not going to work for us in that respect so just as an as an, an example sorry sorry no thanks Caleb that was probably greater clarity than I could could offer um so in terms of violence interruption we fund an area seeking to design to develop a violence interruption standalone alongside tertiary mentoring or are you only looking to hear from existing violence interrupter projects Tom what I would say is, is if you do have an idea of violence interruption uh, or, or design or a project that you have in mind, reach out to us through again the grants inbox um, because this may just be a follow up conversation, um, and it may be that the, the, there are two different things that we're talking about, but it may be that there are elements of violence interruption within a tertiary mentoring program as well. But we're happy for you to reach out to Caleb and I through that grants inbox to really pick pick that up more so. Um, I am probably going to stop there because I would end up answering all the questions without um, uh, uh, delivering the rest of the slides and I will pick up um, the rest shortly. Um, so, Caleb, if you could move on um, to the next slide for me, please. So this bit now is we're talking about the evaluation, why we evaluate and what does it look like in practice? So, as I mentioned before, we don't fund any delivery that we can't evaluate. And that's really important to us. And that means both evaluation and projects are equally as important and must be integrated. We can't pull these two things apart um, and they really have to work well together for us to be able to achieve our aims as a What Work Centre and ultimately find out what is best for the young people that we're here to serve. Um, so that means that we work really hard to find a promising project. And when a grant round first opens, that's exactly what we're looking for, people being able to apply with a promising project. And then later in the stage, we understand where, as projects have got through to the later stages of commissioning, those projects, um, which independent evaluator would best match that project um, to ensure that it can be tested well and for us to really be able to understand whether the project is able to achieve some of the outcomes we're most interested in and uh, as intended. Thanks, Caleb. So why do we evaluate? Um, I think it's really important, as I mentioned before, it's about putting the young people first. It's about what's work, about learning what works best for them, for who, uh, when and how. So which young people does it work best for, in which circumstances and what do, does delivery or effective delivery look like? 
Um, and by answering some of those questions, it enables us to be, enables us to be able to provide the best possible care, um, or at least be able to provide and inform, for example, the toolkit in terms of the types of um, projects that are available and what that looks like in terms of the evidence or outcomes that may come from that delivery. Um, it's also really important that we test projects so we can understand whether they're harmful or not. Um, it's not just about understanding whether something works. Equally, finding out whether, some, whether something doesn't work or if it's harmful also helps inform our decisions and helps inform policymakers and commissioners across our sector. Um, it also supports uh, grantees to, to improve their programmes and make the case uh, for further uh, potential funding by going through a really robust evaluation process um, it enables you to to be able to draw on things that have worked well less well and use that as an organization to be able to sell uh, your project as well as also helping us inform uh, the evidence base of the area as well uh, which leads on to point three we're here to to build that evidence base there's still lots for us to learn in the space of youth violence and with each grant round, we're chipping away at being able to understand more and more to build that evidence base to ensure that commissioners are really able to commission projects based on strong evidence, based on strong evaluation and really understanding what works for young people. Um, and it also allows us to, to share best practice, being able to um, share with other practitioners, other organisations and really then start to scale up what works. And importantly, taking that knowledge, taking that evidence and making the case for change so things can change at scale to be able to uh, deliver evidence informed practice to young people. Thanks, Caleb. So what does that mean in terms of what we're aiming for for this particular round? So I think the first thing to say is, is the work um, uh, for this particular round, a trusted adult. Um, there's still quite a lot for us to learn within this area, um, still within mentoring, still within caseworker and key worker models in the context of a trusted adult. So with that in mind, we're going to expect most projects that come through this grant round to be ready for uh, what we call some form of impact evaluation. So that might be some form of efficacy trial um, or effectiveness trial, likely efficacy. Um, but we do appreciate there may be projects that require an early stage stu study, so that could be pilot studies. And in the very, very few instances, there may be some feasibility studies that we pick up on. Um, what does that mean in practice? So in terms of impact evaluations, we are looking at things such as randomised control tri trials or quasi-experimental designs. That basically means, are we able to find out what would have happened um, in the absence of a particular project? Um, and really being able to compare the results of the intervention um, being delivered to young people and uh, business as usual or um, uh, normal delivery to, to, to other young people as well. So we can really understand the difference that, that it, it makes. Um, and this is basically our 10 steps that we are wedded to in terms of an organisation. And as I say, it's really important that for this grant round, we're able to fit in predominantly from point, uh, point five and six, but we may touch on point four around conducting a feasibility study. Um, if you could move on for me, please, Caleb. If you want to know more about our guidance in terms of evidence and evaluation, um, please do go onto our website and you'll be able to see two things. Firstly, our, our, our staged process, process of commissioning. And secondly, really being able to under, understand evidence and understand what that means in terms of um, how we run evaluations and how we run projects in the context of evaluations and work collectively to ensure evaluations are embedded into project delivery and not bolted on. And we do this primarily to ensure several things. Firstly, to make sure we can we can have the highest quality delivery whilst also having the highest quality evaluation without having to take too many compromises on each approach. So that's really important that we take we, we, we take um, that uh, that way forward with with every project that we particularly fund. But please do look at this section of our website. We will circulate these slides. Um, after after today's session so you can see where you can find these videos but they are really informative and I think you'll see lots of templates and support on there for you in terms of our resources. Thanks Caleb. Before moving on to the next section um, there may be a couple of other things on here uh, in terms of questions and answers for me to pick up on so I will try my best to pick as many as I can. 
Um, so one person on here has said, would, uh, would the activity have to be based in a building to be considered? Our youth work takes place in a park, but would, be, would this be classed as detached? Um, I guess, Rachel, it would really depend on how you're working with the young people, and that might be in terms of how they refer to your projects and then how you deliver your projects, so not necessarily. Um, I guess it's more about how you come into contact with young people, how you're able to work with young people with those key referral mechanisms and what does that look like in practice, and therefore how are we able to, to, to evaluate um, the project itself. If your first port of contact is by going out and meet, meeting young people out on the street and then you're building that relationship before you start any form of referrals or delivery, Caleb, tell me if you think I'm wrong. I think that would be more detached youth work than the type of delivery we're interested in. But if you have referral mechanisms where young people are identified through to you and you're just going to them, you know who they are, you can work with them, but it's not in a building, then that may be something that we do consider because that sounds like it's a slightly different um, model. Um, can we be part of a consortium or does it have to be one organisation? We welcome consortiums. We really do, especially if it ensures there's a good representation of the young people that you're, you're uh, working with in the community, in, in the communities you're working with. So please feel free to, to set up that consortium. Um, what we would just say is, is one organisation is the lead. So when they're leading the application, they're the people that put it in, they're, they're the people that put the information in. Um, and then um, uh, could it be a key worker working with a family with the young person within this? Um, I think that might be more aligned to another round that may be up and coming, um, but it may be something that you want to reach out to us about and talk, talk to in a little bit more detail because I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that. So please do just um, reach out to us in the grants inbox and we can give you uh, maybe a better answer if you explain a little bit more about the design of your, your project, which could be useful. Um, so can this fund add an addition to the support offered or just take on more numbers? I'm not 100% sure on what that means, Ivan. I, is that, can you work with the young people you're all working, already working with or do you need to take on new numbers? I would say your delivery needs to be with new young people so we can effectively test it. Um, so if you're already working with young people, we wouldn't be able to understand where they started from and what their journey would look like in terms of uh, progression against key outcomes. So you would need to work with new, new young people, regardless of whether it's in the same area or reaching new sites. Um, our program includes a mixture of tertiary and lower tiered interventions. Um, would the tertiary only element be considered for the application? Yes, John, that's correct. That's correct. Um, but that doesn't necessarily stop you delivering the projects as a whole, but we would only fund the bit that we were most interested in. Um, so that, that's just something to be really kind of uh, clear about. Um, uh, let me have a look. Does a project already running have to currently include the mentoring work to the same outcomes specified here for this cohort of young people or could we currently be delivering something more broadly to this age group and aiming to add this funds element as a new specialism um i guess the question would be the specialism you're, that you're bringing on is there already an evidence base for it and are you bringing it to your project to add to it and it would suggest that there is um, real potential either in the academic literature or out in, in, in wider practice that would suggest it would maximise your delivery and uh, really add to the young people that we're trying to reach. So I think just really think hard about what you're trying to add to your delivery and what that would add and how that would align to our um, application guidance in terms of young people we're trying to reach and the, the areas in which we're working in. Um, if we're currently running a program with great outcomes and high demand, would you fund a further worker to optimize delivery and increase reach and engagement? Um, reach and engagement are and being able to expand um, youth workers or practitioners 
if that allowed us to reach the numbers that we would need to reach to in order to be able to um, do the evaluation and therefore fund the project in the way that we would want to, then yes, we do consider that. We do consider taking on more staff if that allows us to do what we need to do. So please do take that into consideration when you're putting your application in. It would definitely be something we would be open to. Is there a reason why EF won't fund the feasibility or a pilot study ahead of an RCT? This is increasingly common in applied research and allows opt optimization of an uh, intervention ahead of testing impact. Um, so we do. Uh, sorry, Caleb. Yeah, and, and just to throw in, in, in that tranche, um, do, are they are, are, are partners involved with choosing with the evaluation partner process, choosing them? And uh, a third question uh, is, um, how does a control trial work? So if you do the three together, we answer. Yeah, so questions. in terms of a randomised control trial, we do, um, we do also look at pilot studies and we have said in this particular round, we'll look at pilot studies as well. Um, uh, on the very rare occasion, we, we will take into consider a feasibility study, but that's, that's, um, that's less likely to happen. We're more focused on, uh, uh, projects that would be ready to be able to deliver a pilot or an internal efficacy pilot uh, and then moving on to a, a full efficacy, which could be a randomised controlled trial or quasi-experimental design. Um, the reason we do that is because there are many projects that are already being delivered at scale that we really need to understand whether they uh, are able to deliver impacts against the outcomes of interest. Um, if we spend... Um, um, uh, a lot of our, I guess, resource and time at feasibility. What we run the risk of is not being able to take all of those projects through, but we do have a balance within our portfolio to make sure that we do we do get that right. Um, and often most projects that are ready for some form of efficacy trial, whether that's a randomized control trial or a, or a quasi experimental design, we always do some kind of pilot first. That may be an internal pilot, but we do do some type of uh, uh, pilot first. Um, in terms of um, uh, evaluators, um, we're always happy to take on feedback from projects. However, it will always be YEF that makes the final decision on matching the evaluator, ensuring there is independence and it's the right evaluator for the project, evaluator for the project, but we would always uh, welcome feedback should people have that feedback. In terms of how certain designs work, whether it's a randomized controlled trial or a quasi-experimental design, um, randomized control trials are always our preference um, uh, as much as possible, um, but we will explore all methods and part of that would happen later on in the commissioning process in, in partnership with, a, um, with an evaluator. But essentially, it allows us to identify some form of what we call control group. So uh, a group of young people who are not receiving your project, uh, but will be receiving something else and understanding what the difference is between the young people who, who are receiving your project and the young people who aren't. And um, to really understand, is there a difference in terms of the outcomes being achieved within those projects and is one better than the other or are they both the same? Um, the design itself we would work on collectively. So really don't worry too much about what that means in practical terms. That would be something we would look at further down the line. Um, but it's something that we would just want people to be open to as part of the process uh, that we go through commissioning. Um, I wonder whether I continue with the rest of the application, uh, uh, rest of the PowerPoint before kind of uh, hitting any more questions. Fantastic, thanks Caleb. So what does assessment look like? So you've gone through the eligibility part of your um, application form and you've then got to the main stage application and you start to complete the main stage. It then gets submitted to us. What are we looking for and what does that look like in practice? For each of our rounds, each of our theme grant rounds, we have eight core assessment criteria. Um, so there's eight things that we're really looking, looking for throughout our assessments. Um, and collectively, those eight things are split into two groups. Firstly, is it a great plan, i.e. is it a promising project? Is, is it a project that really uh, has potential? Um, and is there a strong capability of the uh, lead organisation um, and maybe the consortium who are supporting that lead organisation being able to strongly deliver um, that project and therefore deliver it well? Thanks, Caleb. So what does that look like in practice? So if we start off with a, a great plan, what do we mean when we say a great plan? There are four key things that we're looking out for for a, cake, for, for a great plan. 
The first one is, is the project aiming to achieve a worthwhile outcome? When we talk about a worthwhile outcome, we talk about the outcomes that YEF are most interested in. So what are the outcomes that re we're really trying to uh, test and work towards throughout the life course um, of, of, of us as an organisation? What you'll see is, is in every funding round um, in the application guidance, we clearly identify the outcomes we are most interested in. You will see in the application guidance for a, a trusted adult um, a list of outcomes and their definitions that we use from our framework that we are most interested in for this grant round. Um, and you will be asked as part of the application to identify no more than two outcomes that you believe that your project will focus on. I know many projects will think that there'll be many more outcomes they're interested in, but one of the things we really want to do is understand what do you think your primary outcome or outcomes are for this project? We know there may be many others, but what are the things you're primarily focusing on? The next um, criteria is if delivered well, how likely is it that the outcome will be achieved? Um, so what we're really looking at is really a clear understanding of what the project is. So is there a clear narrative? Is there a clear journey of the, the activities being delivered? How the young people enter into the project? What, they, what, what their services and activities and support do they get all the way through um, to exiting uh, the, the, the project itself? And what does that mean in practical terms? And do those activities, do they, do they seem likely that they would achieve the outcome that, um, or the outcomes that you've ticked in criteria one? That's really important to us because what we want to understand is how likely will the activities that you uh, have within your project will lead to the change we're most interested in for this grant round. We will also ask you as part of this to understand or to be able to present the evidence or information that allows you to believe that the activities you deliver within your project will achieve the outcomes you're most interested in. Now, some of that might be from prior um, evaluations that you've been involved in before, and that could be feasibility evaluations, pilot evaluations. It could be that you have access to um, outcome data on administrative um, services uh, or administrative um, systems. So, for example, uh, you may collect, um, somebody mentioned being part of a PRU. There may be outcome data that's collected on SIMS or other systems that you use that you're able to present to show that there's potential for change over time. You may also be able to, to, to use academic evidence or evidence from other people who have delivered similar things to give weight to your argument that would suggest that your mentoring program or your key work or case model program um, and uh, or your integrated program uh, has potential to be able to achieve these outcomes. Once you've done that, the next criteria is aiming to reach the right type of young people. Essentially, going to our application guidance and understanding the type of young people that we really, really want to support and work with within this grant round, um, and really showing that your, your project is aligned to working with those young people is essential to us. Um, we're really clear about young people we want to reach within each of our grant rounds, and we're committed to make sure we do that. So uh, criteria three is just making sure that who you're with, you're wanting to work with aligns the young people that we're most interested in working with with the grant round. And then criteria four, um, likely to lead to change. So this is this is a slightly bigger um, uh, a question, if you will. So if a project is found to work brilliantly, let's say we commissioned the project a few years down the line and we found that it worked brilliantly, how would we share this practice? What would happen? How could we use the information that we've got to champion change? Would that be by becoming a bigger organisation? Would that be by sharing good practice and training others? Would that be by um, being able to influence or change policy? So it's really being able to look at understanding if it works well, how do we take it and really affect change? Thanks, Caitlin. Um, then moving on to the next part of our assessment, so the next four criteria, um, and these are really focusing on, on uh, capability to be able to deliver, so really having a strong plan. So the criteria five is likely to reach the right type of young people. So what do we mean by that? Well, you've already said the young people that you're interested in reaching. Yes, they're probably align or there is strong alignment with the young people we want to reach within uh, the grant round. What we then want to see is what are your methods of really being able to reach, recruit and engage young people throughout the life cycle. So end to end of your project. 
Um, and therefore, what is the likelihood of you really being able to reach them and work with them throughout the, the life cycle of the funding? That's really important to us because we, we have a real commitment to make sure that we, we can um, really understand what works for these young people. Um, the next criteria is able to deliver. So this is really um, starting to um, ask applicants to really identify um, what are some of the key areas um, or, or challenges you may face within your delivery? What are some of the mitigations you have in place? Every project has challenges. Every project will need to find um, identify their risks and mitigations. Do you know what they are? Do you have reasonable um, uh, mitigations and management processes in place to be able to uh, attend to those? Um, are you able to understand what the training of your staff looks like and some of the key components you would expect to see within delivery? Um, and it's really teasing those bits out to really understand um, uh, where you believe your project is at and how you um, intend to, to deliver and manage it well. What I would say is, even if somebody says um, a, a risk that they've identified is a high risk, providing the mitigations are written really well and we understand what they are, that really does not put us off. We would rather see a project thoroughly identify what risks are, identify the level of those risks and be really clear on how they manage them and let their expertise, um, I guess, and, and practice shine through on that. Um, and then criteria seven is whether something is uh, valuable or not. So that is really looking at the number of young people you're trying to reach. Um, ideally for this grant round, we want around 100. But if you're just shy of that or the numbers aren't quite there, don't worry too much. Um, although that's what we'd really like you to aim for. There are things we could do if your, if your project is super promising. There are things that we could do to, to work with you to, to uh, overcome some of those um, challenges on reach if we need to and then able to deliver at scale I think somebody mentioned in the questions earlier is it just delivering to our, our cohort we're delivering to now the likelihood is is there will need to be a, an increase in scale to be able to reach the number of young people we want to we want to work with in some way um, so uh, really understanding what you might need to put in place to make that happen and whether you have experience of delivering to more numbers or whether you would be able to work with partnerships to be able to do that would be would be really helpful. But again, it's just recognizing the things you think you might need to be able to achieve that scale. So if you're saying that you would deliver to more young people than you ordinarily uh, would reach, then really saying how you would do that would be would be super helpful to us. If you could move on, please, Caleb. This is really important to us, so through every grant round that we work through, we have a real commitment to equity, inclusion and diversity, um, and in particular working with young people from marginalised backgrounds. We know that disproportionality, so uh, uh, um, some, some young people are disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. Um, or significantly overrepresented in the youth justice system. Um, and we really want to work hard to understand how we can best support those young people. How do we um, tackle disproportionality? How do we tackle discrimination? How do we reach young people who may ordinarily not um, access or would struggle to access some of the services that are often um, uh, offered through some of the mainstream um, organisations or services that we have? We are really keen to understand how you reach young people and how your delivery is culturally sensitive. Um, we really want to see that coming through in, in your um, applications. We're really keen to see if you have specific partnerships, so you're working with organisations who bring that element um, to your project. But really understanding how you get to grips with and are able to address the different needs of different young people that we are here to serve is super important to us. So we'd really want to see that addressed strongly within your application. Thanks, Caleb. Um, using our online portal, so if some of you have used our online portal before, and if you go onto our website, there are links to this portal. Um, it is reasonably intuitive to use, but there are several top tips that I would give you based on running a number of grant rounds now. The first thing I would say is, is um, always make sure that you write the answer to your question out in Word or Excel first and save it. Um, nine times out of 10, the portal is absolutely fine, but it's always good practice to save your answers just in case there's a technical glitch. Um, always make sure that you um, are um, uh, able to, and if you are going to uh, put in some information, for example, you're going to 
go back to the form. You can resume the form at any point. Check your email address and your password uh, just to make sure that there aren't any typos or anything like that. We can rectify that if we need to. Reach out to the grants inbox if, if that needs to happen. Please do not use the back and forward buttons. It's really temperamental and you might lose your answers within, within that. Um, and I know the heartache of having to spend time of filling out an application form to lose your answers, which again is why I go back to the point about saving your answers. Um, and, and at the end, if you're ready to submit your um, application, there is a button at the bottom when you're reviewing your application that if you press print, you can save your application as a PDF. So these are all things that will be able to help you do the things you want to do with the portal. If you're struggling or if you need any support, please do reach out to us through the grants inbox. Caleb, if you could move on, please. I think I'm, uh, I, I think you may all be, uh, have had enough of my talking at you. So maybe it's worth going through some of the questions, Caitlin. Yeah, super. Thank you, Sarah. Whilst you were busy uh, sharing useful uh, and needed information with colleagues, uh, we've answered uh, quite a few questions uh, in the chat chat function or the Q&A webinar function, which is, this is all new to me, by the way, but fab stuff. So we'll, we'll work through these ones and, and, and Sarah, please, play in if you think I've missed a trick. Um, so to kick off, um, can, can you provide more information on what is meant by best match the, the programme? Do you take into account ability to work well together as a team? Well, the, the key thing here, any sort of consortium bid needs to really stipulate and show that the partnership is really well warranted and has a track record of working together. What we're really interested about is to show how you've done that in the past already, rather than for example, six or seven organizations coming together to then say that we can reach scale to deliver this project. So remember, um, we're, we're trying to understand what are the best approaches so that we can work for change. In order to do that, we need kind of the best parts of the England and Wales to come forward and to give that a good go. And we need to you know, put the wind behind them to help them sail and, 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 and make the, the case for the evidence that they'll produce as to whether it works or not. So, the bit about the best match is to ensure that the, the organizations you're working together can really stipulate that. Because when we go through the co-design period, which we'll talk about um, quite shortly, uh, we, we will find that whether uh, that, that partnership, that team works, because we really rely that on that to, to get information back around monitoring and reporting so that we can feed the evaluation that needs to come out of that. So that's really critical. What we don't want is, um, consortiums that haven't quite engineered the way to work together and therefore it puts their program at risk program or organizations leaving Sarah okay Caleb, can I also come in and if you're talking about best match in terms of program and evaluator what we're then looking at is the evaluator that has experience of working within the area um, but also experience of the type of evaluation we're, we're, we're most interested in and understanding um, basically are they the right match for the project because they are able to bring sufficient experience and expertise of working within the models we're most interested in um, with the young people we're really interested in as well um, and also within the, the um, uh, type of evaluation we're most interested in also so they're the things that we look at. Yeah, and just throwing that we really want it to work. It's a partnership, it's the dream team. We really want it to work. So all of that matching is really important for us and we take that as a considered approach. Um, can can the project build on an existing project? Uh, yes, it can, uh, as long as it's new young people. Methodology might be, is the same and it's new young people we can test. In our mentoring programme currently, a minority of young people will meet history of harmful or challenging behavior so effectively a minority element of the young people would meet the tertiary level we're talking about um if you can't meet the scale of what we need uh, in terms of working with us then i would say this probably isn't the right fit for you because within that bracket you need enough children to be able to test this properly um, and then there is another question as to um, the probability of being able to go from low risk, risk young people, which is a different type of approach, to high risk individuals, which is much more intensive, and how your your, your organisation is set up for that too. So just be aware of that as a notion. Um, we, we haven't got too long left because we've got to tell you some other bits about what the timeline looks like. So we'll see if we can do that and then come back to any questions we have. Uh, Sarah, do feel free to have a go at um, answering them um, as, 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 as stated here. So other resources, uh, this is really worth its weight in gold. This is the 
Youth Endowment Fund Toolkit. The toolkit is effectively the best and most available evidence uh, behind a particular approach today. And, and, and this, will, this will continue to move, but it's, the witch, it's effectively the witch guide to youth finance. And if you're delivering an approach, what you can do is go in there and find out what the strength of the approach is, uh, what the summary of the approach is, and what the key characteristics. This will continue to be, this is a, to build. This is a free accessible platform where you can go find things out about the programs you're most interested in or you're delivering on. You'll see there are gaps. So some of the reasons why we're building the evidence base is because there are gaps. And the idea is that some of the evidence we'll build, we're going there. Commissioners, decision makers, on the other end of, of decision uh, protocol are looking at this as to, as to work out where they should put some of their money because actually the resources um, available to them to do similar things around their research isn't really available. So we've made that readily available and it will continue to build. And that's the purpose of this. It will really... Um, uh, 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 evangelizing for evidence to go to the right places so it makes change for children that's which is the reason why we're here uh, in terms of the application timeline so applications are open at the moment uh 30th of september they closed on the 25th of november uh so we're giving you a solid uh two months to be able to do that because that's based on feedback that we that we received and um, we have the shortlist between the 7th and the 23rd of February. It's really important that if you're going to apply, you need to put those shortlist interview dates in your diary uh, because that's when we'll need to speak to you to have uh, a bit more of an idea of what, what, what you're doing. And equally, the co-design workshops are the same. Uh, we, we, we have overlaying rounds and limited capacity to really do this. So we, we, we kind of say, get this in your diary nice, nice and early. Then we have our co-design workshops from June to August. That is the period where we say, right, you told us that you could do X. Let's look at it. Let's make sure it's really nicely positioned. Let's make sure that it's going to hit what we need. You have what you need. Evaluators have what they need so that then we can really test this. And the whole purpose of that is to effectively start to road test some of the things you said in your application post interviews. And then, and then we have a final approval in September. And this is where we take it to our grants and committee, uh, grants and evaluation committee internally to say, yes, these are the programs we think the Youth Endowment Fund should fund. And then we'll let those colleagues and organizations who are successful know before we kick off with our, our, our uh, grants round. And um, the shortlist applicants I will be informed in early February. Uh, apologies about that. The uh, the uh, animations worked a different, a little bit different than the expected. But before the shortlist interviews, applications who are shortlist will know in early Feb. Because but February is the window for whether you've made it through to the next stage in that respect. Um, and then and then once we're all, all good, we will we'll kick off um, in with delivery in October twenty twenty. Three. You see, there's a bit of a long timeline because all of this is the working outs. So some of the questions you're asking us now is really to give you an indication of what's to come later in that respect. Um, we've got about a minute left, so we'll see what we can answer on the premise of this. There was one question which I would say uh, where uh, a colleague asked us, what are the in indicative costs that we're expecting? What's the sort of budget? Actually, it's up to organizations to tell us that because you might have a very different methodology around how you work with 100 young people. And so really, you've got to be able to show why if you scale up, it costs so much. Um, and just a really quick example, you, your offer might be working with one young person for five hours a day. That is a completely different cost to someone who's working with young people for one hour a week. So um, we're leaving it nice and wide and open because really we're looking for you to tell us um, why you cost what you cost in terms of your budget. Um, we'll bring, yeah, go on, Sarah. Sorry. Taylor, is it just worth, just so people are aware, when we think through budget, if you look at the application guidance, what you'll see is we're looking to fund between six and 10 projects with uh, six to 10 projects and therefore six to 10 evaluations with those projects. The total budget for the grant round, the highest end budget is around 12.8 million, uh, which you'll see is being published. We don't give indicative costs by project level because it really depends on the project itself, like length of delivery, intensity, those types of things. 
but understanding that you've got between six to 10 projects and evaluations within that project envelope will hopefully show you, we do appreciate that these will be probably slightly more expensive um, projects than maybe we, we, we have funded in other grant rounds. So I would just say cost it as you would ordinarily cost cost delivery um, and we can see what that comes out, out as. Um, we, we wouldn't want you to think that uh, you have to do it in any other way. We're coming to land and we're already a minute over. Thank you so much for joining us. As we've said before, if you have any further questions that you felt, actually, I didn't quite understand that, uh, please do reach out to grants at youthendowmentfund.org.uk. Uh, we hope we have everything you need. And for those who are uh, watching this via the video playback, please do also get in touch. We're really keen to make sure that uh, the right organisations apply and have the best shot at getting the funding in order for us to answer the research question around what we're looking at here. So thank you all from myself, from Sarah, from Hannah and from the Youth Endowment Fund. Goodbye. <laughs>